Hello, and welcome to the National Book Festival from the Library of Congress. I'm Guy Lamolinara, and I work at the library, and I'm here with Bruce Feiler, whose new book is Life is in the Transitions, Mastering Change at Any Age. Bruce, thanks for joining us today. My pleasure, Guy. Thank you for having me. Have you here. Really enjoy it. Um, your title of your book, Mastering Change at Any Age, makes me ask the question, does cha mastering change at any age or apply no matter what age you are, or does it d differ according to what your age is? Well, that's funny. The uh, First of all, thank you, Guy, and, and thank you to the uh, entire Library of Congress, not only for what you do for books and ideas in your unparalleled way on the planet, but for this incredible job and ingenuity that you've all shown in taking this jewel of American letters and, and turning it into a virtual event this year. So let me, uh, let me answer your question you know, this way. So the heart of this book, um, as you know, is that I set out after going through a life quake myself, this kind of moment of massive change, to collect the life stories of what turned out to be hundreds of Americans in all 50 states, people who lost limbs and lost homes and changed careers and changed religions. And here's a uh, ambulance going outside my door and uh, <laughs> as we speak, someone's a life-changing experience, right? People who got out of sober and got out of bad marriages. And I was looking for kind of themes and ideas that could help all of us in times of change. And so a lot of what I looked for, I found, but I was wrong about a couple of things, okay? So the, f the first thing that I was wrong about was the idea that um, how you get through a medical life quake or, or a work life quake or you know, getting fired from your job or losing a loved one or going through a natural disaster, that each of these would involve a different toolkit. And it turned out I was just flat wrong that one of the kind of interesting revelations about this was that it turns out you no know, whether the experiences voluntary or involuntary, whether it happening to you or to the entire community, that the toolkit, <laughs> the toolkit for mastering the transition turned out to be the same. So that's the first area that I was wrong. The second area or a second area where I was wrong addresses your question. So my original idea was that I should only talk to people who were over 40 because I wanted to talk to people who'd kind of been beaten up a little bit by life. Um, and it was my wife, actually, who told me that I was wrong, a role that she quite enjoys playing in my life, as you might imagine. Um, and she, she, my wife is, her name is Linda Rotenberg. She started an organization that supports entrepreneurs in 50 countries around the world. She has about 500 millennials working for her. And she's like, you realize that millennials also have a lot of difficult circumstances, and they also feel like that they've gone through a lot of life. And so I broadened the spectrum and... Uh, talked to lots of people, and of course, she was right about that. Now, so to, to the specific question you've asked, of does it matter what change? I want to say yes and no. And the the no, I'll start with the no. The no is that the idea, and kind of one of the big ideas that this book is arguing against, is that the idea of the linear life that we grew up with in uh, the 20th century, which is most popularized by Gail Sheehy's passages, and passages says we all go through the same thing in their 20s. Same thing in our 30s. We all have a midlife crisis um, at 39 and a half. And that book kind of popularized the idea of the midlife crisis. It turns out that that is totally bunk. And I think the best example of that is the pandemic. Everybody, we are going through this collective involuntary life quake. If you are 39 and a half, then this pandemic is a midlife crisis. But if you're 27 and a half, you're also going through um, a crisis. If you're 67 and a half, you're going through a crisis or if you're 14 and a half. So the point is, this has nothing to do at all with um, uh, with birthdays that end in zero or these kind of artificial constructs. So that's the way in which I wanna say that uh, no matter what age you are, that the toolkit for mastering change is the same. The way I wanna say that this idea is a little wrong is that this idea that's kind of the heart of my book of nonlinearity, the idea that we're going to, the idea of one job, one home, one spirituality, one sexuality, one source of happiness from adolescence to assisted living, that's the kind of the old linear life. It's been replaced by the nonlinear life, which has many more twists and turns. This is the heart of my book. 
Xers get this idea much more intuitively than do baby boomers. And millennials get it even more intuitively than Xers. So those of, I was born in 1964, which is the nominally the last year of the baby boom. And so I think those of us kind of 50 plus, if you will, we're still haunted by the ghost of linearity. So we are still kind of resistant to the idea of change. So while the toolkit is the same, I do think it is sometimes a little harder for older people because they may be more kind of resistant to it than younger people who accept that the pace of change is quickening a lot. Okay, would you say your own life story inspired you to write this book or was it a life experiences of other people or a combination of those things? Um, I would say that, uh, here's how I'd answer that question. I would say that my own life experience completely shattered the idea of a predictable linear life that I grew up with and that I expected. And then in a lot of ways I had, I grew up in Savannah, Georgia. I left there and I went to Yale. I left there and I went to Japan. I started writing letters home. Like you're not gonna believe what happened to me. When I got back six months later to Georgia, everyone said, I left your letters. I was like, great, have we met? And it turned out that my grandmother had Xeroxed them and passed them around and they went viral in a sort of 1980s sense of the word. And I thought I should write a book about this. So in my 20s, I wrote books about Japan and England. I spent a year as a circus clown. In my 30s, I went back and forth to the Middle East and wrote a series of books um, about religion, walking the Bible and Abraham and where God was born. I got married, I had children. That's the linear life. That's like the fantasy of like, you know, I discovered what I wanted to do. I did it for no money. I had some success. I got married, I had children. But then in my 40s, I was kind of walloped by life. And I first had cancer, then I almost went bankrupt. Then my dad who has Parkinson's tried to take his own life uh, six times in 12 weeks. And so this was a life quake in kind of every metric of the term that I later came to use. And so that was my own experience. But the, the honest answer is that I actually thought I had to write about this, but I got stuck. But then as I began to tell the story, everybody else had the same story or a similar story. like. My wife had a hospital and my wife had a headache and went into the hospital or died. Um, my boss is a crook. I'm being sued for X, Y, or Z. My brother has stage four, this, that, or the other. And what everybody was saying was some sort of form of like the life I'm living is not the life I expected. Like I'm living life out of order. And, and I called my wife and I said, no one knows how to tell their life story anymore. And I've got to figure out how to help. So my own experience then listening to other people say the same thing, like I'm just confused by life, that led me to go out and start asking and collecting these life stories. But the truth is I didn't really know what I was gonna expect. And I didn't. And it wasn't until I listened to all these stories that I began to detect these, detect these patterns of these disruptors and these life quakes, and then the life transitions that grow out of them. Would you say that there's any life quake in particular in your life that has thrown you for the biggest loop? or surprise you the most? Well, this is such an interesting question because it, it allows me to talk about this term life break. So the kind of the, the, the main idea that emerged from this is that the linear life is dead. It's been replaced by the nonlinear life and the nonlinear life has many more life uh, you know, twists and turns. So the basic unit of the nonlinear life is what I call a disruptor. So a disruptor, is an event that kind of breaks the normal. And we go through three dozen in the course of our lives. That's one every 12 to 18 months. Uh, that's more often than most people feel a dentist. Most people see a dentist. And I use this term disruptor on purpose because most of the people who write about these kinds of life events, they use words like crisis or stressor or you know trauma or some word that kind of has a negative connotation. And it was very clear to me that um, all of these events were not negative. And that carries over till you get to the life break. So we go through three dozen disruptors in our lives. One in 10 becomes what I call a life quake. So that's three to five times in our lives, we're gonna go through a massive disruption that's kind of higher on the Richter scale of consequences and has aftershocks that last for years. And again, life quake. It turns out that 53% of these are involuntary. So an involuntary life break would be, you know, a diagnosis of getting fired from your job, a natural disaster, of uh, losing your legs in an accident, your spouse cheats on you. 
but 47% are voluntary. So you start a new venture, you change religions, you cheat on your spouse, you move. And so, you know, to me, the kind of the two signature life quakes in my life in a lot of ways are on the one hand, the cancer, but also three years before that, becoming a dad of identical twin girls. Okay, that's a wonderful event. It was a wonderful event then. It's a wonderful event now. There have been plenty of moments when it hasn't been so wonderful, but that's a life quake. Like everything about my life was overturned by this joyful event. So I'm kind of grumpy about the modern fascination with grit or resilience or a post-traumatic growth, because this wasn't a trauma, but it was still a life quake. And I still had to remake everything about my life. And so what's, you know, I used to say when, when we had, when we had, when my wife and I had twins, we were, I was like, oh, it would be all hands on deck. Like everybody would come together and help us. Instead, it was everybody run the other way. <laughs> but when I got cancer, I thought everybody was going to run the other way and it was all hands on deck. So it's a that's a, so in some ways having twins was in an odd kind of way more isolating, which makes it more difficult than was having cancer three years later. Okay, I have a question from one of your fans. She says she loved your book, Looking for Class. Ah, Could wow. you tell us about your path for choosing subject matter for your books? Well, that's okay. So first of all, thank you for that. And uh, I, I, did I mention it earlier in my string of my life? So my first book. Um, which I sold 31 years ago this month, actually, and uh, which I actually spoke on the mall about. Um, this is, I think, my fourth uh, trip to the National Book Festival in, in its in various iterations over the years, including an incredible visit to the White House when Laura Bush was hosting it. The um, and so the answer to that. So my so my first book is about Japan, about teaching junior high school in Japan. Then I went to Cambridge and got a master's degree, and I wrote this book about that called Looking for Class. And uh, then I spent a year in, in the circus and that was book was called Under the Big Top. So in my 20s, I was sort of, I was kind of living my life and the books were coming out of it, right? So I went to Japan because I wanted to go to Japan and I act, started writing these letters home. And if you've been learning, looking for class, then maybe you and I have been doing this for a long time. But th those letters were literally literally written on, on um on crinkly airmail paper. Like, the, remember the onion skin that was so, they didn't have lines, so the pad of paper had the lines, so you could stick it under the under, onion skin so you could like see the line and write it along the top. So, um, uh, and those letters just struck a nerve and I decided to write a book. I was 24, I didn't know anyone had ever written a book. When looking for class, I went and did the experience because I was, I was trying to get this degree and the book came out of it. The circus was kind of 50-50. Like I'd, I'd always, I'd learned to juggle when I was 13. And I did, I joked I used to put myself through high school by doing my and birthday parties. And I ran a children's theater when I was in college. Um, so in my 30s, I was kind of living my life and the books were coming out of it. I mean, in my 20s. In my 30s, it sort of changed. And then I started doing these experiences in part to write about them. So in my 30s, that was the, the, the kind of four of the five Bible books. And then life took over again. So then I got the cancer and I wrote Council of Dads about that. And so my life sort of has kind of bounced between there's something I'm interested in and going to do it. And then life wallops me in some way and I react. And then in the process, kind of learn and uh, set off to find something else to write about. But thank you for that. Thank you for coming on these journeys with me. I wouldn't still be doing this today if it weren't for readers like you and and booksellers out there and libraries out there. So here's to reading and writing and books today. Thank you. We have another question about one of your books. My book discussion group recently read your book, Learning to Bow. Wow, I got this is like old time day. Since writing Whoa. that book, have you had any additional insights into your experience? So since writing that book, so that book is about a year I spent teaching junior high school in a small town um, in Japan. I was just... Uh, back in Japan last summer and back in Tokyo for the first time since the late um, since the late uh, 1980s. You know, it's interesting. You know, let me make an observation about that. So I said, so here I was, just graduated from college, in this town called Sano, Japan, 50 miles and 50 years north of Tokyo, and I was incredibly isolated and I was incredibly alone and 
writing kind of gave me a way to process what I was experience, experiencing and then connecting, this is of course before the internet, and connecting with people um, on the other side of the world. So my new book, um, Life is in the Transitions, it's about how people go through these life quakes. And one of the, and, and, and in some way, the, so the, the book talks about the idea that transitions involve three phases, like the long goodbye, where you say goodbye to your old life, the messy middle, where you shed habits and create new ones, and the new beginning, where you unveil your new self. And I just did a conversation before joining the National Book Festival with a writer's group that is doing Life is in the Transitions. And by the way, a, a kind of special offer because it's a, it's a wonderful day. We're celebrating books in the nation's capital and online. If your book group is doing Life of the Transitions, you know, I've, if you will send me an email, go to brucefiler.com or any of the social medias of Bruce Filer. And if I'm able, I will call in and answer a few questions and kind of in the spirit of, of all sticking together at this time. And I'm so touched by the reaction to this book, which is top 10 New York Times bestseller, et cetera. But the question that kind of got the most attention in this book discussion group I was just doing before I joined today was about creativity. And what I've since learned is that, you know, creativity, years ago I was living in Washington and where I was writing books in Washington. I was interviewed by the Washington Post for an article about creativity in Washington. And I was making the point that there is creativity in Washington, but the challenge for Washington is that Washington, the culture of DC is about polls and public opinion and kind of listening to what the country is saying or doing or feeling or wants, and then having public policy that kind of responds to that. It is responsive to kind of public opinion. And creativity is the opposite of that. Creativity thrives when you're isolated and alone and apart uh, in some way. And so people in these interviews about their life transitions talked about astonishing acts of creativity, like the most astonishing acts of people sang and they danced. I talked to a guy named Zach Herrick, who was an army sergeant from Kansas, um, black, raised by a white family, had his face shot off by the Taliban, had 31 surgeries between the tip of his nose and the tip of his chin. And he used creativity, cooking and painting and um, cooking and writing and painting to bring himself uh, back to life. People learn the ukulele, all sorts of incredibly inspiring stories. And I bring that up because let's now go back to Japan. So now thinking about that experience, first of all, who am I? I'm this young, young kid, just graduated from college. I'm isolated and alone. And a lot of people, they journal, they write. I talked to a woman who went through a very difficult year. Her husband fell off a ladder and was injured. She's in Hollywood and, and, and she just goes through this difficult year. And she decides when she's through with it, she's going to try stand-up comedia, stand-up comedy. So her way of, you know, like creativity is to tell, um, is to go to, comedy clubs and write jokes uh, because she wanted to kind of like assert herself after being a caretaker for a lot of people. So two things about this. So number one, I'm isolated and alone and I turn to writing, which is kind of where learning to bow comes from. But Japan in a lot of ways, kind of a challenge that Japan has had perennial is that it its entire culture is about meeting, you know, uh, fitting in. And, and and emerging with the group, that idea in Japan that if 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 you're if if the sunflower is a little too high, you're going to cut it off. If the nail is a little too high, you know, from the other group, you're going to beat it down. So I think that 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 J what Japan did, the way, looking back on the education system now, what Japan did was the greatest job in the history of the world of building up the middle and making sure the massive part of the country. Um, uh, could could take advantage of the kind of the Japan miracle and enter the modern world, but the United States, where our middle sometimes lags, we're much better on the ends. We're much better on taking care of people with special needs, and we're much better at taking care of people who are who have kind of outsized, non traditional uh, creativity. So that experience was very creative for me, and I think that um, it made me appreciate all the more the creativity um, that that sometimes Japan lacks. You've talked about your cancer diagnosis, which obviously had a big effect on your life. Um, your twin daughters were just toddlers when you received that diagnosis, and now they are teens. How have they reacted over the years to this and having so many different dads? 
So the ca so the backstory, I got diagnosed with a cancer. I asked a group of six friends to form a council of dads. Um, I wrote a book about this experience um, as I was talking earlier. And there's kind of big news about this book, which is that this year, after literally 12 years after I created the Council of Dads, the book became a primetime series on NBC television called Council of Dads that was filmed in my hometown of Savannah, where they uh, a, a, a dad played by... Um, uh, uh, played by, um, oh my gosh, I'm forgetting his name. I can't believe it. Um, uh, the, um, it'll come to me in a second. Um, he dies of cancer and he forms a, a, a council of dads. And so like the single greatest thing about this, um, about this uh, uh, experience, Tom Everett Scott was the actor, sorry. The greatest thing about this experience was that my daughters who turned out to be kind of theater kids, we went down to Savannah and they were in the pilot and they got to read all the scripts. And so it was a, a powerful experience for us because they were really young at the time. And now, and they, you know, people used to say to me, oh, don't worry, your kids are so young, they won't remember this experience. And I was like, that's the worst thing to tell me because that means they won't remember me if I die, uh, which, you know, looked, looked quite possible at that time. Um, so uh, what I feel is that all these years later to answer the question is that Friendship is challenged in this country at this time. That we all have our work, men and women, three quarters of women work outside the home now, and we have our family. And one of the great things about contemporary life, having written a book, Secrets of Happy Families, about this, is that we take parenting much more seriously. And so you've got women in the workplace, which is new. You've got dads in the parenting space, which is also new. One of the things that has suffered is friendship and friendship gets getting pushed aside. So the most special thing I would say about the Council of Dads is it created this way for my for my closest friends to be part of my family. So that these dads, they're not friends and they're not family, there's something else in between. And we have this breakfast table that we eat at that has these slogans of all the dads that my wife made. And so I feel like, I feel we all feel, especially the girls privileged to have them uh, in our lives. And there's been also kind of a reciprocity that we feel that one of the dads had a medical event a couple of years ago and there was a big family milestone and the, the dad was not able to show up for his own child's milestone. And, and the, um, the, the wife of this dad called and said, ah, you may not want to come. And my wife, Linda, she was like, no, this is a council of dads moment. Like you have to go now um, <laughs> because you have to show up for him in the way that he promised to show up for you. Great. What role would you say that your faith has played in your life and getting through life quakes over the years? Well, that's an interesting question because um, uh, nothing is more linear than faith these days. And this is not how we talk about faith. And I think that my own experience, you know, I, from time to time, somebody will go, you know, go to my website or some social media platform and ask me, like, you know, a question like, what, what religion are you? Or what is your faith? Or how do you believe? And I'm like, I wrote five, <laughs> I've written five books about religion. Like, can, can people possibly want to know more about me? But I think that, you know, to, to, to use, to talk about this in the prism of life is in the transitions, I will say that like a lot of people, that my faith, my belief, my practice, my interest in religion kind of has been nonlinear. <laughs> So I grew up in Georgia in a you know in a tight knit uh, in a tight knit community, but I grew up Jewish in Georgia, and so that meant I was a bit of an outsider in a place where religion really mattered. Then I went off into the world, and this wasn't a particularly part of my big part of my life. Then I found that religion was suddenly you know for many years in the wake of 9/11 like the center of the world, like and religion is still one of the five big kind of facets of life that defines being alive, your beliefs. Um, and, uh, and so suddenly that was, I think, a kind of a life quake for all of our beliefs. Like, are we going to have religious war? Or are we not? Is religion going to help bring us together or is religion going to tear us apart? And so I felt incredibly privileged to be a part of that conversation, uh, to write a series of books, to be involved in a whole, you know, hundreds and hundreds of interfaith events around the world. So the idea that, that kind of religious movements were stepping up and saying religion just doesn't have to be divisive. It can also play a role in bringing us together. I felt just thrilled to be a part of that conversation. You've developed something you call the Filer Faster Thesis. <laughs> tell us what that is and tell us how you developed it. Okay, so um, uh, the Filer Faster Thesis, um, everything about that question is right except that I didn't develop it. It was, um, what happened was, 
uh, this is great because I'm telling this in, in DC. In 2000, the year 2000, between the New Hampshire primary and the South Carolina primary, uh, I went to a book event at a bookstore in Upper Manhattan with Bob Wright, Robert Wright, the distinguished science writer and a dear friend uh, then and now, and Mickey Kaus, who at the time was a blogger for Slate and you know, kind of one of the leading voices in sort of internet writing. And we were having dinner at a restaurant that closed in the pandemic, a Chinese Cuban restaurant. And I was talking, we were talking about what happened was McCain had just won the New Hampshire primary and Bush was trying to come back. And the question, and, and the race was very heated. And what I said was, oh, we process information so much faster. Think about how much slower it was in 2000 than it is in 2020. Um, and don't worry, people will process the McCain victory and there'll be time for Bush to come back. And that was the point of the conversation. And Mickey went home, coined this in Slate Magazine, the five or fastest piece thesis, credited me and it went on to become a thing. And the world has only gotten a lot faster uh, over time and think of the pace and now we don't have a news cycle. We have like six news cycles in the course of a day. And again, in the context of life is in the transitions, another example of the pace of change is quickening. We have to master change um, at a much faster age. I see this comment in the chat of someone joking that he's actually 39 and a half. Congratulations. The pandemic for you is a midlife crisis, but it's a crisis for everybody else too. And we're of all different ages. Life is coming faster. So actually, uh, there is kind of, in its own way, a direct line between the fighter faster thesis and life is in the transitions. Do you think you'll ever run out of ideas for books to write about? Does that ever happen? Do you ever have writer's block? Um, I had, uh, okay, those are completely different questions. Um, the, the, um, <laughs> uh, let me, let me answer them quickly. Do I think, I, I hope, I don't know if I will or not. I hope I don't because to me, um, you know, we were talking about that. This has been such a fascinating conversation because we talked about learning to bow, we talked about the circus, and we talked about Council of Dads, and we talked about looking for class. And somebody, in, in the middle of that, I was in the circus. And somebody asked me if I, you know, kind of ran away and joined the circus to write a book about it, which I was talking about earlier. And I was like, no, I, 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 don't, I, I don't have these experiences um, to write a book about them. I write a book about them because I want to have the experiences. Like I'm driven by the experiences, not the writing. So to me, as long as I'm experiencing, as long as there's something to think about, as long as there's um, a place to go and a question to ask, I hope I'll be doing that as long as I can. And for me, the natural way to do them, to explore them is to write about them. There's other ways of, you know, there's other forms out there. There's television, there's movie, there's podcasting, there's blogging, there's journalism. But I hope I never stop asking um, questions. I got writer's block on this project. I knew, uh, I started this, I did a storytelling project with my dad after my dad tried to kill himself, where I sent him a question every Monday morning for what became years. Tell me about the toys you played with. Tell me about the house you grew up in. How'd you become an Eagle Scout? How'd you join the Navy? How'd you meet mom? And this man who never had written anything longer than a memo, one question, essentially one page at a time, backed into writing a 52,000 word autobiography that I'm in the process of editing uh, to the, uh, these days and hope to someday have in the Library of Congress as a, a legacy of his life. And after that, I thought I have to write about this experience. It is so profound. And I got stuck. I couldn't figure out how to do it, whether it was the story of the storytelling, my dad's story or my story. And that's, and I put it aside for a couple of years until I came back and began hearing that everybody was having this problem. And that led to this process of collecting these life stories. So I hope to never have, I hope to never stop having ideas, um, but I've now know enough having done this for 30 plus years that every book has its own journey. And sometimes that journey can be painful along the way. Bruce, this has been such a pleasure talking to you. I'm so sorry that we're out of time because I could go on and on with questions, but unfortunately we have to end this. Um, I want to remind our audience that we've been talking with Bruce Feiler, whose new book is Life is in the Transitions, Mastering Change at Any Age. And I remind you that Bruce, if you want to hear more from him, please go to our website 
at nationalbookfestival.com and go to the stage called Understanding Our World. And I think we can agree that Bruce has really helped us understand our world today. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you.